Joshua chapter 6. And it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. And you shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. And this you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Verse number 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout. Or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. Then you shall shout. In other words, don't say nothing until I tell you to say something. If I tell you to say something, then you can say something. But don't say nothing until I tell you to say something. And if you say something before I tell you to say something, it's going to be a problem. So don't say nothing until I tell you to say something. I want to preach today just using this. As a title, a short title, but a powerful title. I want to talk to you from this thought. Shut up. (laughs) Shut up. Shut up. I'm going to be honest. We could close the service right now. Because some of you right now, ooh, the greatest blessing to your life and the people around you would be if you would just shut up. Your mouth has closed more doors. Your mouth has blocked more miracles. Your mouth, not your haters, has blocked more opportunities for you than the devil or anybody else. I just wish you would, ooh, shut up. You do know that silence can never be misquoted. (laughs) Some of you get that tomorrow. (laughs) Shut up. Do, Do me a favor, just look at your neighbor for the last time today and just say, oh neighbor, I got a word for you. Matter of fact, it's two. Shut up. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. <laughs> there is a time to shout. <laughs> but for right now, do us a favor. Shut up. <laughs> Ooh, let's pray that you can sit down. Father, help us today. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Shut (laughs) up. Did you feel the awkwardness just of the silence? Some people couldn't even let us sit in the moment of me saying nothing. They actually had to say my title and say, oh, yeah, talk about it. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) It's interesting what silence will do. Many of us spend our whole lives avoiding the silence because we don't want to hear our own thoughts. But the message today is simply, shut up. I'll be honest with you, I am a competitive person. I'm a very competitive person. I'm one of those people, I don't like to lose. Anybody like that? I I don't like to lose, I like to win. As a matter of fact, I hate losing more than I like winning. Uh, I want to be I want to be in the first spot. I want to be in the first position. I don't want the silver. I sure don't want the bronze. Give me the gold. As a matter of fact, 
I love to win so much. I'm so competitive that if after this service you were to invite me over to like play pickleball or wiffle ball or Pictionary or something with you, I would politely decline. I would decline uh, because you would lose respect for me as your pastor. <laughs> because I'm telling you, we'd be over there and be like, oh, it's just a game. I'd be like, but it's not though. It's very serious. And I didn't come to play games. I came to win. I am one of those people that I am competitive. I want to win. And can I just go on record and say, I don't think it's anything wrong with that. I think it's okay to want to win. It's okay to actually want to be the victor and want to be on top. Away with this ideology that is bad to have a first place and to have a last place. I think we gotta pray for the parents of this generation because have you seen what they're doing to sports with this next generation with their emotional, brittle feelings that we gotta say, oh, everybody gets a prize. No, they're still, we're not keeping score. They, they tried this with my kids' little league. They tried, they're, they're not keeping score. And I had to let them know, yo, I'm keeping score. I'm going to let you know <laughs> whether you won or whether you lost. They're going to give you a nice little granola bar and a juice and say you're a winner. But I'm going to let you know after this game whether you're a winner or not. Because I think that's important. It's okay to know there's a victor and there is a loser. There's nothing wrong with that. We are trying to implement this in our family. We have family game night. We play Uno. That's our jam. We play Uno. And all of our kids know how to play Uno now. And it's, ooh, I'm trying to show them your daddy don't play I came to win. It was so sweet. The other night we were having a little family Uno night and Remy, my youngest, she's five. She is the sweetest little thing in the world. I saw her cards. She don't know how to play. She just have her cards all out. And I saw, I saw she had a draw two and she's about to play a draw two. I said, Remy, you gonna put a draw two on daddy? And she pulled it back. She, said, she pulled it back. She said, no, I'm not going to put a draw to. I love you, daddy. And gives me a kiss on the cheek. It was so sweet. It literally melted my heart. If my heart could melt. I came to win. This heart is built like Teflon. They reversed that thing right back and I put a draw for her right on her. Said, oh no. Come to lose. That's why it's called Uno. It's not dose. I'm trying to be, trying to be number one. <laughs> I don't like to lose. I want to be a victor. And if you're honest, come on, you're the same way. You don't want to lose. Be honest. Isn't there something on the inside of you that wants to be on top? Isn't there something on the inside of you that has an instinct to have victory? Can you even admit that today? Some people can't even admit that, especially believers. My goodness. Some of us think it's a sin to win. And somehow God gets the glory out of you walking around depressed. And, oh, no, it ain't me. It's him. No, I ain't trying to win. I'll just be in the back. Are you serious? There's something on the inside of you that actually wants to conquer, that wants to be on top. And can I tell you the reason that is on the inside of you? The reason you have an instinct to be victorious is because you are made in the image of your victorious God. And because your God has never lost a battle. Because your God has all power in his hand. Because your God is the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords because your God sits on heaven's throne and the earth is his footstool the fact that you want to win is indicative of the fact that you were created in his image and because he is on top guess what you want to be on top because he's never lost there's something on you that when you lose you say this ain't right I'm not supposed to go through this I'm not supposed to be in this position because you were created in the image of your victorious God what an awesome God that we serve, that he is God all by himself, that nobody voted him in and nobody can vote him out. He is God and beside him, there is no other. God wants you to win and believe it or not, God is okay with you being great. Did you know that? Oh, okay. I got to interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon so you can engage in a verbal exercise. Would you just say this? Say, God wants me to be great. This time, say it like you actually believe the words that are coming out of your mouth. Say it with your chest. Come on, say, God, God wants, me wants me to be great. To be great. God, God wants me, wants me to, win. to win. Do you believe what you just said? I hope that you do. I hope that you have not shrunk yourself back thinking that God only gets the glory out of you walking down with your head low. No, he actually wants you to be great. He wants you to win. All right, give us some scripture for that, Robert. I'll give you some scripture. Have you noticed whenever the disciples were following Jesus, they often had arguments about who was the greatest? 
It's their top argument all the time. He would catch them arguing about who's the greatest. He'd be ahead of them. They'd be in the back talking about, I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. I cast, who cast out more demons last week? Who passed out more fish and bread? I passed out more. They're arguing the whole time. And Jesus has to come back periodically and say, what y'all talking about? As if he didn't already know what they were talking about. And they're arguing about being great. And I noticed all throughout the Gospels when that would happen, Jesus never, he never got onto them for aspiring to be great. He never rebuked them for wanting to be great. However, he was always talking to them about the pathway to greatness. He's like, I'm cool with you wanting to be great. I just want to show you the pathway to greatness. He says, I have no issue with you having ambition to be on top, but I do have issues if you don't know the way to get to the top in my kingdom. Because the way to get to the top in my kingdom is to get down low. The way to get to the top is to actually serve and get to the bottom. He said, I have no issue with you wanting to be exalted, but if you want to be exalted, the way to be exalted is to humble yourself because that's the way that my kingdom works. This is an upside down kingdom. It is not like the kingdom of this world that pushes people down so they can be on top and get the victory. My kingdom says, no, if you really want to get the victory, look at me that left the lofty pinnacle of heaven and came down from heaven to earth and put on human skin and the same Savior of the universe washed nasty feet because he said the way up is to actually come down and I have no problem with you being great I have no problem with you having the victory as long as you know the pathway to victory so here's what God will often do he is often trying to show us the pathway to a victory that he has already prepared for us God is often trying to show you the pathway or better yet the strategy for a victory that he's already given to you. Ooh. Say it one more time for the people in the back. God is often trying to give us the strategy for a victory that he has already given to us. I'm not making sense. It's, it's in my text today, Joshua chapter 6. Did you read verse number 2? Verse number 2 uh, should have shouted you. It made me shout when I read it at the crib. Verse number 2 of Joshua chapter 6. Look at what the Lord said to Joshua. And the Lord said to Joshua, See? I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. Did you read what I just read? And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. Only God can talk in past tense about a battle that hadn't even started yet. They hadn't even started to fight, and God has already given a word to a warrior named Joshua and said, guess what? You already got it. You've already won. He's talking to him in past tense about a victory that he hasn't even started to fight yet. That ought to be good news for somebody that's in a fight right now to know that you are not fighting to get the victory. You already have the victory. What you're actually fighting is to get the strategy to receive the victory that God has already actually gone before you to give you. I have given you. Only God could speak in the prophetic past tense about a victory that hadn't even come to pass yet but God says as far as I'm concerned the city is already yours can you imagine being Joshua what you mean see you've already given me the city what you mean see I see a big wall and I see people in that city yeah but don't look at that Joshua use your other eyes walk by faith and not by sight if you look in the natural yes there's a wall and there's people occupying your space but if you look in the supernatural I've already given you that city and they're just holding it for you until you get there it's already yours who am I preaching to today that knows that somebody already has the job prepared for you. Somebody already has that business prepared for you. Somebody already has that ministry prepared for you. The question is not about the place. God already has the place prepared. He's just preparing you for the place that's already been set aside for you. See, y'all not shouting because you don't believe that thing. That's why you're jealous of other people and you think you got to make moves to make it happen. But God said, if you chill out and get the strategy for me, I'll show you how to walk in the stuff that's already been yours in the first place. Ooh, I preach to myself. Are y'all recording this? I'm going to watch it later. I want to thank God for every door that I have walked into that I didn't have to manipulate. I didn't have to beg. I didn't have to sacrifice my character. I just had to walk into it. And as soon as I walked in, I said, man, this was for me. This was for me. I've given it to you. The prophetic past tense. You need to start speaking in the prophetic past tense. 
I've already been given my husband. Why you bother yourself? Because I'm not settling for nobody. I've already been given my husband. You keep going out there. You keep swiping. I'm going to wait for the one. Oh, God. I'm going to wait for the one that's already been prepared for me. He says, uh, he says it's already, already been, already been given. You just got to walk into what I've already given you. This is why I love the book of Joshua. Because the book of Joshua shows us a leader that is trying to show the children of Israel how to possess what has already been promised. That God has promised them a land. And he's actually given them a land. But you got to go from promise to given to possessing. That just because it's promised and just because it's been given, it doesn't mean you possess it. Joshua is the leader that is taking the children, children of Israel from promise to given to possessing. Oh, I love the book of Joshua. It's a wonderful thing to go from something being promised to something being given to actually having something that you possess. Let's just use a little hypothetical. How many of you, uh, anybody like you need a car? You need a car? Anybody don't have a car? You need a car? You need a car? Have a car? Okay, let's say I'm going to give you a car. Okay, let's just say hypothetically. I got to put that out there because we're a generous church. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I'm going to give you a car. I'm going to give you a car. And everybody hears me make a promise on Sunday, I'm going to give you a car. You should be shouting at the promise. She shouted for it. Do you want the car? <laughs> shouting, okay? You should shout. You got the promise. Promise to give it. Well, what is given? Well, since the car is in my name, I better go switch that title. <laughs> From my name to your name, because it's not really yours. Even though I made the promise, until I switched the name, put your name on the title. Now, it's been given. But you can't drive a title. You can't park a title. <laughs> you can't listen to Spotify in a title. You better go from promise to given. To say, uh, Pastor Robert, I'm just going back to that service. Remember that service you had? Uh, you had the little social shirt on. You said, "Oh, okay." Remember that? I, I didn't. Yeah, you put. I put the title on your name. Oh, I'm so pr thank you. I'm glad you did the paperwork. But I need the. Because until I get the keys, what good is it worth me shouting? over the promise in the title. Do you know what's wrong with church people? Is we will come to church on Sunday and we will shout about the title and we will shout about the promise. Oh, I praise him. I thank him. But we never actually get the keys and start actually possessing the peace that you sing about on Sunday that God actually wants to affect your life Monday through Saturday when that anxiety attack hits you in your office. How I many you know you can use the same worship in here in your cubicle and lift up your hands because he already paid for your peace. And since the title of peace is in your name, why don't you start grabbing the keys and possess it? Oh, I'm tired of shouting about stuff and not actually getting the keys to drive it. It's a horrible thing to just shout about the title and shout about the promise and never actually grab the keys and drive the car. This is what the book of Joshua is. Is Joshua trying to give them the keys? And who is more qualified than Joshua to do this? Ooh, when you get to the crib, read the book of Joshua. I love Joshua. I've been spending a lot of time with Joshua because Joshua is a powerful book on leadership. It's on leadership. I love leadership books. Read John Maxwell, but ooh, don't skip on Joshua Maxwell. His last name ain't Maxwell, but I'm just saying. Joshua has so many incredible principles about leadership because who else but Joshua is qualified to take the children of Israel into the promised land. This is a man that before he was a leader, he was a servant. He served Moses. Remember Moses who was the man, the dude, the one who led millions of people out of slavery and bondage, emancipated them from the tyranny of Egypt and had them taking steps into their promised land. Joshua was there chilling, serving Moses. Before you ever heard his name or heard him speak, he was there serving Moses. He was there on Mount Sinai when Moses saw the glory and got the Ten Commandments. He was there on the side. He was there at the tent of meeting. He was serving Moses, just serving before he ever became a leader. See, God will always put you in the proximity of the position that you will one day possess. 
because he wants to see how can you steward being in close proximity of that position uh, this is why some people never get promoted to the next level and you got to stay in remedial class because you're so busy trying to get your title and get your position but the way to get it is to actually serve with the right heart and the right spirit the actual position that God has prepared for you can you serve a position without having a position do you have to have a title to actually serve Joshua was just serving Moses faithfully he was incredible not only was he a great servant homeboy could fight Oh, he was a fighter. Don't get it twisted. Joshua was gangster. You know you gangster when you ask God to extend the sun a little bit so you can fight a little bit longer. <laughs> Fighting, taking names. Oh, he was bad. And I love him because he knew how to shut. Knew how, to, how do you know he knew how to shut up? Don't forget what he was. He was a spy. He was one of the original 12 spies. And I don't know. I've, I've never hired spies before. But if I did hire a spy, at the top of the list would be your ability to know how to. You cannot have a loud spy. <laughs> that, that, that's just got to be at the top of the list. If you are a spy, you better know how to shut up. I ain't never met a spy in the room talking about, oh, what y'all doing? I see y'all. <laughs> so that lets me know his spirit right there is that he knew when to shut up, but he also knew when to speak up. Don't forget those 12 spies they spent to spy out the land that was already promised, that was already given, that they would one day possess. Isn't it crazy that 10 of the spies came back and said, Now nah, we can't do it. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes and in our own eyes, so we, we can't do it. Don't you love those negative people in your life? As soon as you got any vision, you got any faith, they got a whole PowerPoint presentation. Well, we've never seen that before. Well, I don't know if that can happen before. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm in a season of faith right now. I'm believing God for some ridiculous thing. I, oh, you make me itch. If I start telling you my dream and my vision, and you're the first one to tell me how it can't happen, I'm sorry. You just can't be my friend. In this season, you got to go somewhere. Where I need somebody that when I start saying what God is able to do, I need you to say, is that it? Don't you got more faith for that? God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask, think, or imagine. You better imagine something bigger than that. I need somebody to give God some praise if you got some ridiculous vision, some ridiculous dreams. So you got to find a new crew to roll with. I need somebody that's going to push me into the possibility of what God is able to do. Oh, I need some friends that are allergic to average. That can't stand mediocrity. It's going to say, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Ooh, I'm telling you, you should see the stuff I'm believing God for. And I need people around me that'll say, we can do it. Twelve spies. Only two of them. Josh and Caleb. All the other with the messed up names that sound like diseases that nobody names their kids after. They the one, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb, we are more than able but here's the frustrating part. It's although they had the report, they had the minority report, and they ended up not going to possess the promise and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after being exposed to the land of promise. Whew. Ladies and gentlemen, it is one thing to wander in the wilderness when you have not been given the luxury of exposure. It's a whole nother thing when you are wandering in a wilderness with complaining people and you have been exposed to what's possible. Ooh, you want to feel frustration? It's the frustration of being exposed to bigger but having to stay around small people. You want to be annoyed? Have your dream delayed? Because you're around people who have not been given the gift of exposure. Oh, I came to tell somebody that's praying for God to expand your borders. Be careful because it will change your circle. It will change the people you hang out with. When God expands you to a 
bigger vision and picture of your destiny, it will make you look sideways at the people you're hanging around with. You never notice the same people that are just still stuck at 20? I, what club popping today? Really, homie? 38. You still buying bottles. That's still appealing to you to stand in line. That's appealing. You 52. Yeah, I'm going to settle down one of these days, you know. I don't know who this is for because none of this is in my notes. But receive it accordingly. <laughs> oh, exposure is crazy to be exposed to what's possible. I got a friend. I have never, I have never, ever flown private in my life. Shout out to American Airlines and Southwest if them prices at American too high. <laughs> but I got a friend, he's like, oh man, you should experience it. I was like, I don't need that exposure. I don't need that exposure because I get frustrated already with these TSA agents. I don't need that exposure because sometimes once you've been exposed, it makes the wandering even more depressing. Because you're in the wilderness when people talk about, no, these grapes pretty good. These stupid little grapes, have you seen what they got over there in that land? No, this is pretty good. No, it's not. There's milk and honey over there. They got all kinds of milk, man. Almond milk and oat milk over there. You want this regular milk? Oh, I ain't created for regular milk. Thank you. Can you see I'm frustrated? 40 years wasting my time walking in circles. And God had to let that whole generation die. And it was their complaining that kept them out. And so no wonder when you get to Joshua chapter 1, when everybody's boo-hooing about Moses, oh, we can't believe it, we miss him. And Joshua gets a word from God, Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua is sad, but then he finds out the 11th commandment, thou shalt move on. <laughs> we can't dig him back up. Let's go get back to the promise <laughs> that God gave us. Y'all get together, get together. Come on, we got to go. Let's get this land. And all of a sudden, here is Joshua. Can you see him? This young, well, 80s. But this... <laughs> Come on! <laughs> You're laughing, but some of y'all are wasting years. <laughs> no, you had a little spunk. He had a little spunk in his 80-year-old body. <laughs> Let's take this land. And I love it because as soon as they step towards the promised land, the first thing they encounter is the Jordan River. And I'm amazed at what happens in the Jordan River because they get the priest with the Ark of the Covenant and they step right in the middle of the Jordan River and the water recedes and every single one of them walk across the Jordan. When they got to the Jordan River, I see no record of them panicking. I see no record of them going, what are we going to do? I see no record of them being nervous or sweating. Why is it that when they get to the Jordan River, they have a completely different reaction and response than the generation that preceded them when they got to the Red Sea. Remember when they got to the Red Sea and Pharaoh was chasing them, they were nervous, they were panicking, and God had to speak to Moses and give them a word and say, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight your battles. And don't forget what Moses did. He lifted up his staff and all of a sudden for the first time in the history of humanity they found out that God can split water oh I know why they weren't tripping at the Jordan River it's because they had the history of a Red Sea it wasn't until the Red Sea that they realized God has the power to move water I'm preaching to somebody you need to thank God for your history with him it is your history with him that should give you confidence of what he's able to do right now they would have been nervous about the Jordan River but they found out that water ain't nothing for my God he knows how to move water out of the way you better thank God for your history. You better thank God that you've seen him heal sick bodies before. That you've seen him deliver people before. That you've seen him set people free before. All of that is ammunition for what's in front of me. Look at them walking into water like you're supposed to move. Why? Because I've seen him do it before. He can do it again. Yeah. Yeah. 
I feel like preaching, y'all. Sabbatical's coming, y'all. Hold on. But here's the challenge. Is, uh, I know he can do water because I've seen that. But once I get through the water, I'm now four miles away from Jericho. And when I pull up on Jericho, whoo, I, I see something I ain't really seen before. I see a, a wall that is six feet wide. Some scholars say 40 feet high. So right after shouting, because you know God can do water, the next question is, uh, can you do walls? Does anybody know what it's like to have enough history with God to know, oh, he can do that? Water is easy, but can you, can you do walls? I, I, I'm not negating your power. Thank God for all you've done in the past, but, you, but this is a massive wall. Archaeologists are still studying the city of Jericho and this fortified wall that was massive in its structure. And often when God brings us through the water, sometimes we question, can he really get us? past this wall? Maybe I just preached to myself, but have you ever been in front of a wall and had confidence in God, but going, yo, God did Yo, did Is that the same fly from a couple of weeks ago? I wish you would mess with my sermon again. Do you do flies too, Lord? Does anybody know what it's like to hit a wall? That is so much bigger than you. You, you don't even know where to begin. You, you can't tell yours. Let, let me tell mine. You know, we're, we're shouting. I'm so thankful our CFO, uh, Pastor Doug, is here. But we, we're shouting about the miracle of SDHQ. Y'all, a two-year-old church, a million dollars. I mean, it's unbelievable. But that million <laughs> is a part of three million. <laughs> SDHQ is 8,000 square feet. Three million dollars for 8,000 square feet. Y'all, can I, can I be honest? Uh, I thank God for the wonderful people here at Gillies. Uh, this August, we would have been here two years. Uh, I'm thankful to have a space. Uh, but, yo, like I want a building. <laughs> like I, I, I want to be able to have church like when we want to have church. And when they say, oh, we can't, little baby got that date. Oh, never mind, we go to Whisper. I just, <laughs> I'm kind of over that. <laughs> I want to just be in a position for those of you. Why do they need a building? I'd rather be in a position where I, my, sub, my schedule is not subject to little baby or whoever. No wonder when God started blessing his people, he actually gave them property, all them. What they need a building for. So, so, so it's, it's three million huh, for 8,000 square feet. Okay. So, so they said that for a church our size, huh, we, we need at least 80,000 square feet, 60 to 80,000 square feet to do church the way we want to do church, to have enough room. Do you realize we have to cap our kids' ministry because we don't have enough space to do kids? Sometimes we have to turn families away to, for us to really do ministry and reach people the way we want to. They said, y'all size? I'm sorry, y'all just a big baby. He, the, ar the architect said, y'all need at least 80,000 square feet and, and 600 parking spots. So, so just, 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 just do the math. <laughs> If 8,000 square feet <laughs> is 3 million, how many million <laughs> is 80,000? Yo, that's, that's, a, that's a big wall. It's a big wall. And so you, you come up to walls and the question you're asking, who has got to believe? But can you do walls? If, if, if it's mine, if, if the city has already been given, then <laughs> why put a wall there? I'm not telling, telling you how to God, you God. But I'm just saying, if you've already given me the city, why don't you remove the wall? Okay, take the wall away. And, well, my goodness, take the people who are occupying the land out of the way too. All the Amorites and Canaanites and Termites, take them out the way too. 
and then just put a plush green valley and let me walk all the way through so I can get to the thing that's already mine. You said you would lead me in the green pastures. This would be a good time to do the green pastures and remove the wall, but God, 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 God doesn't do it like that. And this might be a good place to insert this thought that when you are en route to your promise, obstacles are inevitable. Obstacles are inevitable when you are en route to the prepared promised place that God has for you. And I want you to get this in your mind and in your spirit. Stop thinking that if it's God, you won't have any obstacles. That if it's really God, there won't be any opposition. God often puts opposition and obstacles right before the promise. The obstacle is not a sign to walk away. What if the obstacle is actually a sign to start asking God for the strategy and what you need to do and how to get around it? But obstacles are inevitable. I'm going to keep saying it and keep saying it because some of us are confused and we think God is like Amazon Prime and when he gives us the promise, if it didn't come the next day, we got the tracking order. Talking about God, where is it? You said I was going to have the promise and the promise is going to come but it will not come without obstacles. Obstacles are inevitable and here is the tension. Here is the tension. Is this obstacle a sign that the promise is not mine or is it a sign that I need to find a way around it? That is the challenge and the tension of seeking God and communing with God is trying to find out is this obstacle that's been in front of me, a sign I'm supposed to walk away? Because how many you know, have you ever just had an obstacle that was a sign that was it? I have had God close some doors and I stood there for a while. And I waited and walked and came right back and stood back in front of it and still checked periodically. But there are sometimes the obstacle is just a sign that that's not it. And there are other times where you got to have the tenacity, the fortitude, the resolve, and the resilience to say, I ain't walking away because you told me that's mine. Now I just got to figure out what is the strategy for me to get what's mine. This is why as soon as they cross the Jordan, they don't go straight to Jericho. They actually go to Gilgal. If I had time, I would talk about Gilgal, but I'm not going to talk about Gilgal on a Sunday because Gilgal, who you know, that's the place where Joshua takes a knife, not to kill the Canaanites, but to circumcise all of the men of war who were born in the wilderness and had not yet been circumcised. Oh, that was a day in the camp. <laughs> Right after coming through the Jordan. <laughs> What's next, Joshua? Well, let me tell you what the Lord said. Y'all sit down. <laughs> Circumcised every single one of them because before God gives you a conquest, there must be consecration. He says, I need you to be set apart. No wonder they had to go through circumcision. No wonder they had to celebrate the Passover that they forgot to celebrate when they were wandering in the wilderness because God is bringing you back to the place where you know who is going to help you get the victory, that this will not be your might, this will not be your ingenuity, this will not be your arm, this will not be your flesh any victory that you get it will not be by your might or by your power how many know every victory will be by his spirit it'll be by his finished work it'll be by what he did on the cross so go on and sit down and get cut what about my promise your promise is coming let's deal with your ego no you're not because you always need the credit we got to cut that out of you we got, we, got, we, got, we got to get that out of you. Yeah, but, but, but what about my promise? We, we'll get to your promise. Let's deal with your pride. <laughs> let's, let, let's, let's deal with, with your pride. Let, let's cut away all the unnecessary things of the flesh that will stop you from possessing the promise with peace. So they have to heal. They have to heal after Gilgal. And then all of a sudden, they walk up to Jericho. Can you see them? A million plus people looking at a massive wall. And then a million plus people looking at Joshua. <laughs> Welcome to leadership. And then Joshua looking at God. <laughs> you do walls? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I do walls. 
Let me tell you the strategy. He said, Josh, um, I want you to get seven priests, seven ram's horns, and you have them out in front. I want you to get the Ark of the Covenant, which represents my presence. He said, I want you to walk around the circumference of the wall one time the first day. Do the same thing the second day, the third day, fourth day, fifth day, six times around for six days. He said, but on the seventh day, I want you to walk around the wall seven times and then take those seven priests with those seven ram's horns and have them blow the ram's horns and then have the people give a shout and the walls will come down. Joshua's reply to that militaristic strategy was, cool. <laughs> Let's do it. Only Joshua that has a history with God would immediately respond to that ridiculous plan with, that's cool. Let's do it. I want to get that Joshua type of obedience. See, so some of us have an obedience that looks cute and that makes sense. Has God ever asked you to do something that looks so ridiculous, that makes absolutely no sense? You already struggling and God's like, yeah, Todd. See how quiet it got on that right there? No, he didn't ask me to do that. He didn't ask me to do that. Has he ever asked you to do so ridiculous? But Joshua has enough history with God that he said, I don't even have the time to waste to vocalize how ridiculous this is. If that's our plan of action, then let that be the plan of action. Can I tell you, God will make obedience look ridiculous and he wants to see how quick you, will you respond to the thing that looks completely ridiculous. What? Anybody that's ever fought a battle with a city that has a wall. No, that's not how you fight with the wall. You either dig a tunnel under the wall, you get a ladder, you go over the wall, or you try to go through the wall. Or another strategy was just to do the battle of Troy. You know, build you a horse and get up in there or just wait them out. Wait them out and see if they'll starve to death and then go in there. But walk around the wall six times and seven times on the seventh day? This makes no sense to anybody that has a militaristic mind. I hear some of y'all saying, well, of course it doesn't make sense for a militaristic mind. It's a spiritual battle, Robert. Don't you understand? We wrestle not with flesh and blood. It's a battle of the spirit. It didn't make sense biblically. No, do your due diligence. Never in the history of Israel did they ever fight a battle like this. The priest, the priest never went to battle. They never put the priest in the front. And to have ram's horns, whenever they got ready to fight a battle, they were instructed to get silver trumpets, not ram's horns. This don't even make sense from a biblical standpoint. What in the world are you asking them to do, God? This makes no sense at all. You don't send priests to war. You don't even bring the Ark of the Covenant out to battle. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse chapter 5 when they tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant to battle and that's when it got captured. You're not even supposed to bring the Ark of Covenant to battle. Not only that, huh, walk around for seven days. I'm cool with walking around six days, but the seventh day is the oh, y'all know the Bible. Is the Sabbath. You're not supposed to walk or work Sabbath. on the Sabbath, but the seventh day is the day they're supposed to do the most walking. He said, yeah, that seven day walk around seven times. This makes no sense. And it reminded me of what God told Joshua. And it's a word for somebody in here today. Don't forget what he told him in the very first chapter. He said, Joshua, over and over, he commanded him, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Why do you want me to be strong and courageous? Because I'm going to ask you to do something that is so ridiculous and outrageous that you're going to need the strength. You're going to need the courage and the resolve that no matter who's telling you this don't make no sense at all how many of you know you got to be so committed to what you know God told you that you'll be strong and stand in the word from God come on is there anybody in here that says I don't care about the opinions of other people I am going to walk in strength and courage over what God told me to do it can look ridiculous to you shut up you didn't get the command I got to do what he told me to do and if he says walk on the Sabbath I'm going to walk 
on the Sabbath. He's the same God that was healing people on the Sabbath and they got mad about that. But sometimes to really start a revolution, you got to break some rules. You got to break the spirit of religion. You got to do things that haven't been done before. So here they are. Joshua, you can play, make this sound real spiritual, Barrett. I'm landing. Here they are with their marching orders. And did you notice? The soldiers never got the battle plan. Joshua did. It would have been awesome if God would have told the whole army, hey, you're going to walk around one day the first day, one time the first day, again the second, third. No, they never got those battles. They have to take it day by day. As Joshua gives the orders, oh, put yourself in the soldier's shoes. Day one, all right, Josh, let's go. Got my outfit on, let's fight. What's the plan? Uh, day one, uh, we're going to walk around the city one time. That's it? Yeah, that's it. You know what, this is why I like Joshua, because he has, he loves to analyze things. That's very, very smart. He wants us to look at the city first and make sure we analyze it real well. That's a great plan. Let's get it. Finish that first day. Day number two. All right, Josh. Ha-ha. Let's go. Who are we fighting? How are we getting past this wall? Hey, we're going to do the same thing we did yesterday. One lap around. Don't say nothing. You know what? Thorough. That's great. Might have missed something day one. Let's do it again. Day three. Now you know people. By day three, what's the plan? Oh, we're going to do what we did yesterday. Walk around. By day three, you know people and they were like, is he for real? We just spent 40 years walking. Why are we coming around the wall to walk? But there's a difference when you're walking in disobedience and complaining and prolonging your journey as opposed to getting information and walking in obedience even when things don't make sense. That's a different type of walk. They both look like you're walking in circles, but one, you're walking in a circle of disobedience and complaining. The other one, you're walking in a circle of obedience saying, God, however you want to win the victory, however you want to give me the city that's already mine, I am willing to listen. I'm willing to obey. I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm not going to complain because complaining stopped me and it wasted years of my life. I don't know who I'm talking to but maybe you're on day number five and you're walking around a wall and nothing is moving and nothing is changing and God wants to know can you keep walking when you don't see a sign or evidence that anything's changing can you keep coming to church when you don't get the raise and you don't get the check in the mail can you keep serving even when you don't get the recognition can you keep trusting even when God doesn't produce the miracle on your timetable I don't know who this is for but God told me to tell you don't stop Stop walking just because the wall's not moving. God is still doing something. Even when it seems like the wall is standing still. Shut up and keep on walking. God's silence doesn't mean he ain't working. Sometimes he does his best work in the dark. I used to think that Jericho was about to shout my whole life in church. They would have a praise break on the shout. But if we reduce Jericho to a shout, seems like if it was just about the shout, he would have had them go straight to the wall. Day one and go, ha! Anybody can do that. Anybody can shout on day one. Anybody can shout after seven laps. I want to know, can you walk and shut up? For six days without any evidence that the situation is changing without any evidence that anything is moving can you trust God ladies and gentlemen this is Christianity it's walking and trusting even when I don't see evidence of it. It's walking and trusting and believing even when it doesn't happen on my timetable. It's walking and trusting and believing even when the mall hasn't moved. I feel like I was supposed to tell somebody 
you don't know what lap you're on and you're about to quit. What if you're on lap number six? You don't know what lap you're on and you're about to quit. God told me to tell you, shut up and keep on walking. If you are going to open up your mouth, open up your mouth to praise him. Open up your mouth to give him glory. But I'm telling you, don't start complaining. He does not inhabit the complaints of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. Somebody in here needs to get your words shut up and keep on walking. Because if you'll stay faithful and you keep on walking, how many of you know after day six when they lifted up that ram's horn and Joshua gave the command oh you can shout a whole lot louder when you've been quiet for a long time I don't know who this is for but I dare you to get up on your feet and act like you just finished lap number seven and open up your mouth and give God the best shout of praise that you got that wall will come down but the silence before the wall is what gave you the power to open up your mouth and shout. It's not just the shout that brought the wall down. It was the 12 laps of silence that preceded it. Anybody can shout after the seventh lap. Can you walk and shut up? even when you don't see change. The enemy has gotten us to buy into a lie. He's gotten us to buy into this myth that just because we don't see the evidence of the wall moving, God's not doing anything. In what world does that make sense? I have never in my life done a sit-up and seen the ab pop right after the sit-up. Ever. I wish it worked that way. Once, If it was one sit-up and abs, I would do sit-ups every day. Anybody that's had any transformation physically will tell you that it takes months and months of walking and working and kale salad and not crumble cookie and walking and working and diet coke and walking working and then before you know it, you're like you walk past the mirror and victory just hits you like wait a minute hold, hold up who is that that's how it works it is the same often in the spirit don't let the fact that the wall's not moving make you walk away what if you're on lap number six? What if it's the seventh day and you don't want to put on your battle shoes? I'm going to ask every head be bowed. Every eye be closed. Father, thank you today for the word that we need. Lord, I thank you that you're a God that still speaks. Since creation, you said, let there be, and it was. You don't have a problem speaking. But Lord, we have a problem listening. So Lord, today, would you help us to shut up? To shut up and trust you. To shut up and hear the strategy for the victory that you have already given us. Father, today I'm praying for my brother and my sister that you're calling them to do something that seems so outrageous and so ridiculous. But you've also given them a command to be strong and courageous. God, would you deliver us from the opinions of other people? Give us a strength, a tenacity, a stick to to keep walking even when it looks like the wall is not moving. Help us to trust you more and more. In Jesus' name, head still bowed, eyes still closed. I need to know who I came for today. I truly believe that this word is a lifeline for somebody that was about to give up and walk away. 
because the wall hasn't fallen down on your time schedule. And God just sent me here today to tell you, don't stop walking. Don't stop trusting. And I believe he's given you the strength today to take another step. If that's you and you know this word was for you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough just as a response to say, God, give me the strength to keep walking. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Just lift it up high enough and long enough to where I can see it. Hands are going up all over this place today. Hear me. That wall will fall down. Some of you are about to walk away from an obstacle because you think the obstacle is a sign to walk away. No, it is a sign to walk around it. That stronghold can and will fall down. Archaeologists say that as soon as that wall fell down, it did not fall in. It fell out and it became a ramp for them to walk straight into the city. I'm trying to tell somebody that very obstacle is going to become the ramp and the platform to usher you into the thing that God has already prepared for you. That's why you can't give up. That's why you can't throw in the towel. That's why you can't walk away from your family. That's why you can't walk away from that breakthrough and that miracle you've been believing God for. Anybody else? Father, thank you today that you're giving us the strength to take another step. Thank you, God. Anybody else? Heads still bowed. I'll still close. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I would love to give you that opportunity today. We say it all the time in social, you can always come home. So with heads bowed and eyes closed today, if you say, Pastor Robert, I need to give Jesus my life today. I'd love to include you in this closing prayer. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I can see and say, today's my day to give him my life. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to this Savior. You come to him just as you are. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Can we pray this prayer as one big family? We're all going to say it, but especially those of you who responded, would you say this? Say, Jesus, thank you so much for loving me enough to be my victory. Jesus, I know you paid the price. You died on a cross, got up from the grave for my sin. You were faithful and obedient to the end. So my response is to surrender all of me for all of you. Lord, give me strength to trust you every day. Give me strength to keep walking even when it feels like the wall is not moving. But Lord, I know that you already have a place of victory prepared for me. I receive it. In Jesus' name, Amen, 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 amen. Come on, would you give Jesus the best hand clap of praise that you got today? Come on, you could do better than that from the front to the back. Can we lift up the name of Jesus?